listening to Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. Old Man Metal's Musings is a proud part of the Screaming Demon Network. And now, without further ado... Hey, this is Old Man Metal, and I hope everyone's doing well, and welcome for joining me today for the third episode of Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. If you see another one somewhere, it is fake news, as they like to say nowadays. I uh, want to thank you for joining me today, and want to say thanks to everyone who watched the second episode. Uh, I talked about cellaring beer and did my first ever video tasting. That was a 2016 Founders KBS Stout that I'd been sitting on for a while. And then we looked at the top five current contenders for my album of the year for 2019. Those bands were Ravenous Death, Warfist, Occultist, Legion of the Damned, and Usurper. And I really enjoyed making that episode, and I've gotten a lot of really good feedback on it. So if you haven't seen it, give it a look yet. That was the second episode. And I want to give a shout out to AJ Nemesis for the theme music. That's a song called Through the Electric Mist. AJ is an amazing guitarist and independent musician, and he's on Twitter and YouTube. So check the credits at the end of the show or the links in the show notes to see more from him. And you'll notice that uh, the intro is back. And that's why I'm talking about the music, because the music is back. So thanks to AJ again. And right now, we are going to go ahead and take a look at our show beer. Get this coffee out of the way. Coffee that I didn't even touch yet. And our show beer today is from New Belgium. And it is a relatively new beer for the, from them. And it's called Old Tuffy. And if you know anything about the ACC, you'll recognize that as the NC State mascot. And this is something new that New Belgium has done. My understanding is that it is a collaboration with the brewing program at NC State, and that's why it's NC State branded. Um, I personally think if they branded it, uh, some of it for Carolina and some of it for Duke, they would make a killing off of it. Um, branding it for just NC State, probably there are some people that aren't going to buy it just because of who's on the can. Um, by way of full disclosure, I am an NC State alum. Uh, I graduated from NC State in 92, and so I don't personally have a problem with the branding, but it just seems to me that they would make a killing if they did it that way. But my understanding is that it's a deal that they have with State and that part of the proceeds go to support the brewing program at State, so it's uh, entirely possible that they just can't even do that even if they wanted to. Um, and someone recommended that I try this beer for a show beer and it was on tap at a burger joint I was at and I got to try it on tap and it was surprisingly good. I don't typically go for really light, uh, pale American lagers. I definitely don't drink the mass produced horse piss, um, that typically goes under the moniker light beer. Um, no offense to you if you do, you drink what you like, I'll drink what I like. But I tried it, and it was really, really, really good. And I'm not a huge New Belgium fan. Uh, not anything against them. I don't think they're a bad brewery. There's just not a whole lot of beer that they make that really excites me. I liked uh, Fat Tire when it first came out. And then having had it since then, um, it just doesn't grab me the way it did when it first came out. And I've actually talked to a lot of people that sort of feel the same way about it. So I don't know what's up with that. But anyhow, this one is really, really good. It is a light American lager. It doesn't have that offensive adjunct ricey taste that a lot of them do. Um, really light beer, crisp, clean. Um, not a whole lot of big flavor to it, which is that's part of the style, but enough flavor to it that it's enjoyable. A little bit more flavor than what you would typically get from uh, your typical light beer that you might drink at a tailgate. And in talking to people that have stocked it, this stuff is selling like hotcakes. Um, it's moving really well down here in Wilmington. Talking to people that I know up in Raleigh, they can't keep it on the shelves up there um, for obvious reasons. So it's doing really well. People seem to really like it. And uh, it's a good beer. And for the type of, uh, type of beer drinking that you do this time of year in North Carolina, it's really hot, really humid kind of weather where if you're outside, it's going to drain you and you want something cold and crisp to drink. So good beer for that. So um, just going to say... Uh, cheers to Charlie for recommending it. Cheers to New Belgium for making it and to Hay Beer for stocking it so that I could buy it and enjoy it with you. And cheers to you.
And that really is a good beer, especially for what it is. Because like I said, not my style that I drink a lot of, a lot of really. Um, so today, we're going to take a look at my everyday carry knife. That's the Nakamura 484S from Benchmade. And that's something that I had said that that was going to be the second episode, but didn't end up working out that way. But that's cool. Things change. you got to be flexible. you got to roll with the punches and be comfortable with change when you have to change. So that's what that rascal looks like. Um, I've been carrying it for about a year and a half, so I've got a good bit of experience with it, and I have formed some pretty firm opinions about it, so that's what we're going to talk about. And I got turned on to the Nakamura because I was interested in the M390 steel that Benchmade used for the blade. And I've played around with a lot of different steels for everyday carry knives over the years, and based on practical and usually pretty abusive experience, I've learned that some steels are definitely better for everyday carry than other steels and i'm always looking for new steels to test with the old trial by fire so when i started looking at m390 um i decided that i was going to have to find a knife that was made with it and i've been reading about m390 which is a so-called boutique steel or super steel and it's known for combining excellent sharpenability edge retention corrosion resistance and wear resistance so it sounded like a great everyday carry steel, and I decided that I wanted to try it. So like I said, I started looking around for knives that used M390, and I found the Nakamura, and I honestly fell in love with it and didn't end up looking much further. And now I'm a good year and a half in with it, so I have some opinions about it, and I figured it would be a good topic for a podcast. So when you talk about steel performance, you're mainly talking about hardness, strength, and toughness. And hardness is the ability to resist deformation. A really hard blade is going to break before it bends. And hardness correlates with wear resistance and edge retention, both of which are obviously very important for everyday carry blades. Strength is the ability to withstand an applied load without breaking. So a really strong blade is going to bend before it breaks, where, like I said, a really hard bla blade is going to basically break before it bends. And toughness is the ability of a material to absorb energy and deform without fracturing. So toughness is a measure of how well something resists um, being damaged by fracture. And for a good everyday carry steel, you really need a proper balance of the three. You want a hard enough steel that the blade's going to take a good sharp edge and hold it. And you want strong enough steel that it's going to resist applied loads that you put on it when you're prying and bending and twisting and doing all sorts of other abusive things to it that most of us do to our everyday carry blades. And you want tough enough steel that the edge isn't going to chip when you do stupid stuff to it, like prying open a paint can or some dumb thing like I would do. So you really want all three. And... I've carried softer steels like Aus 6. That's probably the softest steel I've ever carried. That's an easier to sharpen steel because it's because it's soft, but it doesn't hold an edge as well. I've carried harder steels like VG1 that have great edge retention, but they take a good bit of work to sharpen. And my decided preference for everyday carry based on decades of experience with different steels, I prefer harder steels that hold an edge well. It just works out that you spend a lot less time maintaining a high use blade if it's a high if it's a hard steel even though when you do sharpen it, it takes more effort and more time. Um, another consideration for everyday carry is corrosion resistance. Uh, everyday carry steel needs plenty of corrosion resistance because it's going to get exposed to water and worse, and it's probably not going to get cleaned as often as it should. So everyday carry blade steel is absolutely got to be stainless steel. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it is. You're not going to get away with using a, a high carbon steel for everyday carry. I got a bad habit of picking the beer up and talking into it. I need to not do that. He says as he does it again. Um, so you need hardness, you need toughness, you need strength, and you need corrosion resistance. And it's really a hell of a balancing act because elements that improve one property a lot of times decrease another one. And um, so let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, carbon is the primary source of hardness, and it's a fundal element of steel, or fundamental element of steel, rather. But it can reduce toughness, and very plain carbon steel has very poor corrosion resistance. Nitrogen uh, can replace carbon in steel, providing that hardness, but it does so without the decrease in corrosion resistance, so there's sort of a benefit there. Manganese increases hardenability by stabilizing the steel at higher temperatures, and that allows it to be cooled more slowly during heat treating, and that makes the processing easier because you don't have to cool it as fast. Manganese also increases strength, but it can decrease toughness. Silicon increases hardenability like manganese does, and it increases strength, and it helps remove oxygen from steel during processing, which is very important. 
and chromium is a primary source of corrosion resistance. So you're going to find chromium in pretty much all steels. Uh, it increases strength also, but it decreases toughness in higher amounts, and it decreases edge retention as well. So you gain with chromium in, in corrosion resistance, but you lose with chromium in a lot of other ways. Copper provides corrosion resistance and can promote hardness. Cobalt contributes to hardness by allowing quenching from a higher temperature, and it also behaves synergistically with other elements in some complex steels to improve other properties. So cobalt's kind of maybe a wild card sometimes. Phosphorus promotes strength, hardness, and corrosion resistance. Nickel increases toughness. Molybdenum also increases toughness, and it helps to maintain strength at higher temperatures, increasing hardenability, which in allows the steel to be cooled more slowly during heat treating. Like I said earlier, that just makes the processing easier because you don't have to cool it as fast. You don't have to quench it as hard. Sulfur decreases toughness, but in small amounts, it improves machinability, so it'll get used in not necessarily knife steel so much, but in a lot of other steels that are used in manufacturing. Vanadium improves wear resistance and increases toughness as well, and wear resistance helps with edge retention, so vanadium indirectly improves edge retention also. Tungsten also promotes toughness and wear resistance, and niobium improves toughness, wear resistance, and corrosion resistance, and it can also help provide excellent edge retention. So different elements do different things. Um, sometimes they fight each other, so the elements that go into the, into the steel, into the alloy, have a huge impact on the properties of that alloy. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle is how the steel is treated during processing and especially how the hardening treatment is done. You can take an excellent blank of alloy and completely ruin it by improper manufacturing processes, improper heat treating, things like that. And alloy systems are really complicated. The elements in an alloy can form a number of different phases uh, depending on the processing conditions, particularly temperature, holding times, and heating and cooling rates. Those things can really change the nature of an alloy. Uh, that's something that we'll look at now a little bit. Uh, looking at the phase diagram for plain carbon steel, and that's just two elements, iron and carbon, and the more elements there are in an alloy, the more possible phases. But looking at the, the iron carbon steel phase diagram, you can see that just with those two elements, there's a number of phases that can form in an even larger number of combinations. It's a pretty complex diagram. Which phases form and in what proportions depends on the carbon content of the steel, which you see on the x-axis, and the temperature, which is on the y-axis. And heating and cooling rates and holding times, like I said, also typically play a role. Which phases are present in the treated steel dictates the properties of the steel, since different phases themselves have different properties. So time and temperature and carbon content determine the phases that form, and the phases that form is what determines the properties, because different phases have different properties. So, for example, when you're heat treating carbon steel to harden it, we'll just look at that one thing as an example. The goal is to get all of the steel transformed to the martensite phase, because martensite is very hard, so that's the stuff that you want. And transforming steel to martensite, martensite rather, requires heating it to a high enough temperature to get it all in the austenite phase first, and then you have to cool it rapidly enough to transform the austenite into martensite. So it's a two-step process. And the required cooling times range from seconds to minutes, depending on the alloy that you're working with. And you've got to be real careful with those rates. If you cool it too fast, the steel can suffer from internal strain issues. Best case, you're going to reduce your toughness because you've got internal microfracturing. Worst case, you're going to distort the alloy and actually fracture it and physically damage the blade or the blank if you're treating the blank. Uh, on the other hand, if the cooling is too slow, carbon atoms have time to diffuse back out of the austenite crystal structure and form other softer phases like perlite or ferrite, and the blade's not going to reach its true potential in terms of hardness because not everything got transformed back to martensite. In both of those cases, cooling too fast or cooling too slow, you've taken a blank of perfectly good alloy and turned it into a substandard blade just because of the processing. And the moral is, buy from a knife manufacturer that's got a proven track record of getting things right, like Benchmade. Just because it's good steel doesn't mean it's a good blade. That's not the end of the story. Um, you know, Like I said, you can take a really good steel and really mess it up by handling it improperly. So... What is a boutique or a super steel that I mentioned before? Well, it's a great question. And like craft beer, the term super steel invites debate as much as it does anything else. Today, it tends to refer to highly alloyed third-generation powder metallurgy steels. 
they typically provide excellent sharpness, wear resistance, and edge retention. And so that's what I'm talking about here when I say super steel is those third generation powder metallurgy steels. So where traditional metal alloying involves melting the metals to combine them, powder metallurgy starts with metal powders and you combine them in the desired proportions and then you form them into the alloy blanks by compacting them in a die and then centering them at high temperature. And these powder metallurgy techniques allow much better control over the phases that are formed in the final alloy, which in a traditional melting operation, like I said, would be dictated by the phase diagram. You get what you get. In powder metallurgy, you get much better control of, of the distribution of the phases, and you also get better control of the grain size and the alloy purity. And all of that translates into better control of, over the property of the finished steel. And that's why a number of powder metallurgy steels have started becoming popular for knife making. Uh, because you get really, really good properties and you have really good control over those properties. Uh, the problem with powder metallurgy steels is they're not cheap. I mean, they're just not. They're expensive. They're expensive to make. They're expensive to process. They're expensive to buy. So what really attracted me to the M390 steel versus all the other super steels was the fact that it had almost best-in-class edge retention, which, as I said, I figured out that's the most important property for everyday carry steel, for me at least. And the M390 is significantly easier to sharpen than the few steels that beat it in edge retention. The ones, the few that did have better edge retention, they're known for being really, really hard to sharpen. And hardness on M390 is also not far from best in class. So the M390 blade should take a really, really great edge. And that's important too, because a dull knife is a dangerous knife. And that's just a fact. If you're walking around with a dull knife that you haven't sharpened, you're more likely to hurt yourself with that knife than you are if you've got a knife that's got a proper edge on it. Because when you're using a dull knife, you have to use more force. So you're more likely to slip. And if you do slip, you're more likely to fuck yourself up because you're using a lot of force. Where if you had a properly sharpened blade, you wouldn't have to be using that much force. Force. So that's why I say a dull knife is a dangerous knife, because it is. On the M390, toughness is middle of the road, but it's a good sight better than VG1, which was the blade steel on my last everyday carry knife. And the VG1 did leave a little bit to be desired in terms of toughness. Uh, so that's an improvement that I wanted to make this time around, looking at a new everyday carry steel. VG1 is a good, great hard steel, but it, it doesn't quite have the toughness, and you can chip it, tear it up a little bit easier than, than what I like. Uh, corrosion resistance for the M390 is not far off of best in class, and it's fantastic corrosion resistance, so that's another reason that I wanted to look at the M390. So looking at all those things combined, I figured M390 might be the sweet spot, and if not the sweet spot, at least it would be a really good place to start playing with powder metallurgy steels, which I've never used for everyday carry before. So I figure if I'm going to take a stab at it, I want to take the best initial stab I can. And from my research, it seemed like M390 was going to be that best stab. Turns out I was about right. Um, first off, the Nakamura was stupid sharp out of the box. Brand new, it was the sharpest blade I've ever handled, and that's saying a hell of a lot. I've bought a lot of cold steel knives over the years, and they have been made with some really, really great steel. And Lynn Thompson absolutely pops a boner every time a lethally sharp blade ships out of cold steel. So they put out some ridiculously sharp knives, and they've put out some really ridiculously sharp knives that I've bought over the years. And the Nakamura was sharper than any of them out of the box. I mean, it, it honestly was. The first time I cut stretch wrap off of a pallet with the Nakamura, I literally just held the stretch wrap and tapped the knife down it, and it just parted like the freaking Red Sea. It was absolutely amazing how sharp it was. And if you're a knife person, you know, you can get a pretty good estimate of how sharp a blade is by running your thumb across the blade uh, sideways, um, like this. I'll try to do it where you can see what I'm doing. If you pull your thumb across the blade, you can, once you get used to judging things that way, you can get a pretty good estimate of how sharp a blade is. And what you're feeling is the drag of the blade, the resistance or the drag of the blade across your thumb. It's just something that you can feel. And it's not the most perfect estimate of how sharp a blade is, but it's a pretty good idea. And if you sharpen knives a lot and you use them enough, it, it'll give you a pretty good idea. 
And when I ran this blade across my thumb for the first time, I had never felt an edge that had that intense and fine grain to grab, if that makes any sense. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I had actually never felt a blade that felt that sharp before. So even just feeling the blade, it was obvious that it was, uh, that it was really sharp before I even used it. So in terms of ability to take an edge, the M390 is the best steel I've ever used on an everyday carry knife. That's definitely hands down, no question there. The edge retention has been great as well. It took a surprising amount of use to get it to where it wasn't shaving sharp anymore. And so that's another thing if you're not a knife person. Uh, people who are into knives use this term shaving sharp. And if you don't know what that means, that literally means that you can take the edge and run it down your arm, the hair on your arm, and it will shave the hair off of your arm. And it's sort of a pass-fail test. It, a knife is either shaving sharp or it's not. But it's a really, really good benchmark for, yeah, that knife is really sharp. It's sharp enough. Because until you get a knife really, really sharp, it's not going to do that. And once you get a knife sharp enough to shave, it's pretty much going to be sharp enough to do whatever you need it to do. So obviously when it's when it showed up it was definitely shaving sharp but it took a lot of use before it got to the point that it wasn't shaving sharp so I'm going to go ahead and say edge retention is probably the best edge retention I've seen on everyday carry knife steel too and at this point, it's seen consistent light daily use for about a year and a half. And when you feel the edge, it's still got a good bit of grab to it, but it's not quite sharp enough for the old paper cutting test, which is another knife cutting test. You just take a piece of paper and a real sharp knife, and how far down can you cut the paper with the knife with just one stroke? And um, at this point, it's not sharp enough to even start the cut properly. So it's still sharp enough for everyday use, but it's, to, at this point, not even sharp enough for the paper cut test. Um, if that gauges it for you, gives you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of where it's at a year and a half in. And as far as ease of sharpening goes, I have no idea because I haven't sharpened the thing. Um, and if I only have to sharpen an everyday carry knife once every year and a half, I'm perfectly happy with it taking a good bit of work. So at this point, even if it's kind of tough to sharpen, I'm not going to be disappointed because I haven't had to touch that edge since I've had it. And like I said, I, I use it every day. Not heavy use necessarily, but it definitely gets used every day. Um, in terms of corrosion resistance, no issues on that front. And I'm going to say, aesthetically speaking, this is an absolutely beautiful steel. And I don't know how well I can show you how pretty this damn steel is. It doesn't look like it wants to focus because that's reflecting. Maybe I get it up here where my face is. Get it to focus on it a little bit. But it's absolutely a beautiful steel. It's sort of a matte finish. Oh, uh, and it's just, it really does not want to sh focus on that. But it doesn't matter because I've got some good pictures of it. So it's really aesthetically pleasing steel. It's a really good looking steel. And the other thing about it is, uh, and, and it's still flawless in appearance a year and a half out. I haven't done anything to it that's messed up the way it looks. So that's uh that's good to go from a tactile perspective it is absolutely the smoothest feeling steel that i've ever seen that i've ever worked with if you just run your fingers along the steel itself it just feels like fucking silk never never felt a steel this smooth before and i would have to imagine that that ties in with the with the good wear resistance the fact that it that it it has good wear resistance probably has to do with the reduced friction at the surface that you feel I imagine those two are related. I don't know that. Toughness is about as expected as, or about as expected. It's tougher than VG1, definitely. Um, it's still midland toughness. It's not like a super tough steel. But then again, if it was a super tough steel, it wouldn't get sharp and it wouldn't hold an edge like it does. And again, I just about guarantee you're not going to be able to see it. I'm going to try to get up there where you can, and maybe it'll sharpen, focus in on that edge to where you can see it. I don't think it's going to. But right up there on the belly of the curve, there's a couple of nicks in the edge that I put in there. And I don't know how I did it. Uh, some dumb shit or other I was doing. Uh, like I said, I don't treat my everyday carry blades very well. Don't know what it was that I did to it. Um, but at some point, I nicked the blade in a couple of places. And that's why I say the toughness could be a little bit better. But for the way I treat the knife, getting a couple of nicks in the blade over a year and a half, that's cool too. So whatever. Um, the serrations are... Probably not in perfect shape either, but there's at least not any chips in them. I've done a lot of stupid stuff with the serrations, cutting copper wire and dumb stuff that normal people don't do with knives. But they held up pretty good, and that was one of the things on my last everyday carry knife that was VG1. Like I said, the toughness wasn't as good as it could have been. That's one of the things that I did was chip some of the serrations and actually snap the tips of the serrations off doing stupid stuff. So improvement there. 
So all told, the steel performs as expected, uh, excellent in all the categories, uh, pretty much, and it's definitely a great choice for everyday carry. I'm, I would, at this point, go so far as to say it is the best everyday carry steel that I've ever used for a folding blade. So absolutely, the M390 was a good starter choice in terms of playing with the powder metallurgy steels. And looking really quickly at the manufacturer's specifications for M390, um, we're going to see that M390 is 1.9% carbon, and that would class it as an ultra-high carbon content steel. It also contains 0.7% silicon, 1% molybdenum, and 0.3% manganese. All of those increase hardenability by stabilizing the steel at higher temperatures. That allows it to be cooled more slowly during heat treating and yet still get the same hardness yield. The silicon also helps degas the steel during processing, and the molybdenum increases toughness, and the manganese increases strength. And M390 is further alloyed with a whopping 20% chromium for corrosion resistance, and that is a shit ton of chromium. That explains why it's got such good corrosion resistance right there. The crazy wear resistance and edge retention come from a 4% dose of vanadium and 6 tenths of a percent tungsten. And we're going to look here at the heat treating recommendations, and you can see how complex they can be. And that feeds into what I said before about how important it is to choose a good manufacturer. The initial hardening is done in a nitrogen atmosphere under a 5-bar vacuum, and that's like 90 PSI of vacuum, so that's not a little bit of vacuum, that's a good bit. Um, and once it's heated to the hardening temperature, the steel is held for somewhere between 5 and 30 minutes. The actual time depends on the actual hardening temperature. And then it's oil quenched, which is a medium speed quench. And remember what I said about the silicon, molybdenum, and manganese decreasing the need for a really fast quench. So they get some processability gains there. They're able to use a medium, a medium speed quench versus a really fast quench to get the hardening. The tempering then depends on whether you want optimal corrosion resistance or optimal wear resistance, and in both cases there's an initial sub-zero treatment to transform any remaining austenite that survived the quench, and that initial treatment involves holding the pre-cooled steel at minus 95 degrees for two hours. After that, the steel is heated slowly to the tempering temperature and held for at least two hours, more if it's a thicker working piece. And the tempering temperature should be between 390 and 570 if you want optimal corrosion resistance, or it should be between 950 and 990 for optimal wear resistance. So you sort of have to pick which of those two you want to get the best of. And both of those scenarios actually require two identical tempering steps. You don't, have, you don't do the tempering once, you have to do it twice. And optimal wear resistance, if that's what you're going for, that actually requires a third tempering step at an even higher temperature. And it's worth noting sort of that the final hardness starts, dr starts dropping off really rapidly at the tempering range for optimal wear resistance. So if you're tweaking it for wear resistance, you've got to be careful because your hardness is going to start to drop off on the far side of that. And... Benchmade specifies their M390 as having a finished hardness of between 60 and 62 Rockwell. That could be either scenario or one in between. So I don't know if they're tempering it for optimal wear resistance or optimal corrosion resistance. If it was me making a, nice, a knife with all the corrosion resistance you're going to get from that chromium, I would probably go for optimal wear resistance. But they could be somewhere in between the two as well. I don't know. But from all that, you can see how complicated all the different steps you have to go through just to treat this steel. Um, obviously, if you've got someone who's doing a half-ass job, they're not going to get all that right, and you're not going to get all the benefits of the, of the expensive steel. So taking a look at the knife itself, one of the things that I really like about the blade is it's made with this uh, proprietary axis lock that Benchmade has developed. And the axis lock is different from a standard lockback in a couple of different ways uh, that make it a better lock. And one of the things is, on a standard lockback, you've got a, a locking bar that lies back here in the back, and you press something here to raise it up, and that lets you unlock the blade. So when you get positive pressure on the blade with a lockback, and positive pressure is pressure in the direction upward like that, like if you're cutting something that's positive pressure, that positive pressure gets transmitted from the blade back to the lock. And it's actually possible if there's way too much of it, you can force the blade to make that lock bar fail or force it past the lock bar and your lock back can actually fail. Not a very common thing. Lock backs are generally good solid uh, locking mechanisms, but they're not perfect in that respect. And so what uh, Benchmade has done here, if you see this top little pin here, uh, which is a, one of the pins that holds the knife together. 
when this blade comes back, you see this rounded section here. That section actually comes back and locks up against that pin. So any positive pressure, instead of getting transmitted back to the locking mechanism, is going to get isolated right there in that, in that pin. So that's one of the benefits of the axis mechanism. The other one is that there's no contact between the blade and the locking mechanism itself. On a lockback, like I said, the, the locking mechanism actually butts up against the blade, and that's what holds the blade in place. In this case, um, and I'll do it hopefully to where you can see it, if you look right here, there's this little bar, and that's the locking mechanism. You can see me moving it there. And what you'll see is when it clicks, you're going to see that bar slide up. And when that bar slides up, it just slides up and locks in. It is in contact with part of the blade, but it's not in contact with the part of the blade that comes back from the positive pressure. So that's one of the one of the really good things about this nice knife is it's got a really good proprietary lock on it. And Cold Steel has something kind of similar that's called the Triad Lock. Uh, the Triad is a modified lockback, so on the Cold Steel there actually is it is a lockback with a with a locking mechanism in here. But they've tweaked the lock up to eliminate some of the issues that you have with a traditional lockback. And they also do the same thing that uh, that Benchmade has done here. They have a stopper pin that the blade indexes back onto. Uh, the thing about the Cold Steel Triad lock is it's a bitch to unlock. Um, this one is easy as can be to unlock, and it's uh, it's ambidextrous, so you can unlock it from either side. You know whether you're left-handed or right-handed. The other nice thing about the uh, about the uh, about this uh, Axis lock is it's not a lockback, so there's no locking me mechanism on the back of the blade. And if you look, you see, you can see right through that rascal. So a typical lockback, one of the problems with it is you've got this locking mechanism on the back, which means that pocket lint and all sorts of other crap can get down inside the knife, and then you've got to clean it out. It's a real hassle. Um, this one right here, you don't have that problem. So it's a really cool design for everyday carry just because you don't have to worry about stuff getting up in the knife and gunking it up. And you can see when I release it, there's a little bit of hesitation to want to slide down. I haven't put any graphite or anything on this blade at all, and I've been carrying it for a year and a half, and I don't clean it out hardly ever, so that gives you a good feel for how clean it stays, the fact that it's got that level of functionality um, without me ever having really cleaned it or doing any upkeep on it. So the blade is 3.08 inches long, and it's 0.114 inches thick, so a little bit under an eighth of an inch, and it is a modified drop point design, and it's got ambidextrous thumb studs to assist opening. And those are, you can see, these are the thumb studs right here. And that's what I'm using when I flick the thing open. I'm just putting my thumb up against it. And uh, so again, the blade's set up for ambidextrous use. You can do it either way, either hand. Um, so it's a modified drop point design. And modified refers to the fact that on a normal drop point blade, the point is above the center line of the blade. So if you look at the center line of the blade, on a drop point, the point would be up here somewhere. Um, would be would probably be right up in here. It would be up above the uh, up above the midline of the blade. And on this one, you can see the point is pretty much on the midline of the blade. So it's called a modified drop point design. Some people I've seen call it a modified spear point because of the fact that it's it's pretty much symmetrical about the midline of the blade. Um, and modified spear point, I guess they mean the fact that it's not sharpened on both sides. But I think it's more useful to think of it as a uh, as a modified drop point. And so what that means is that because the point's on the center line of the blade, the Nakamura is going to give better penetration than a normal drop point blade where the, where the point would ride a little bit higher and wouldn't be in line with the axis of the thrust. Um, and you still get the benefit of the big belly, which is this part of the knife. you got a lot of cutting surface. And you also get the strong point that you get from a drop point design. Another design is called a clip point. And with a clip point, it's clipped downward and you end up with a really thin point. And uh, that's one of the problems with a clip point is the points don't tend to be as strong. So for the modified, the modified drop point design, you get most of the benefits of the drop point. Better penetration. You don't have quite as big a belly because you have a little bit more coming up on a drop point, a, a normal drop point design. But good blade design. Um, another thing that I'm going to point out is the excellent, excellent jimping on the thumb rest. And this is the thumb rest right here. And it's called the thumb rest because when you're cutting with it, that's where your thumb rests. And the jimping are, is that little slotting that you see there. And that's just texturing so that your thumb doesn't slip. 
when you're using the blade with some degree of force and the jimping is absolutely fantastic this thing when you get this locked down in your hand it's not going anywhere so really good thumb rise design really good strong jimping and if i dig into that let you see my thumb i don't know if you can see it you probably can but just from that little bit of pressure i put on it it dug into my thumb pretty good so that's a really positive positive grip right there on that part of the blade and looking at it, you'll see I've got the partially serrated blade. About a third of the edge is serrated. And if they made one that was fully serrated, that's what I'd have instead of the partial serrated. But they don't. They make a, a straight edge and they make the combo edge is what that's called. My thing is with everyday carry, and this is not a popular opinion, a lot of people prefer uh, straight edges for everyday carry. I guess it's just what I cut. Typically, I'm cutting cardboard. Uh, fibrous stuff, cordage, stuff like that. And the stuff that I'm typically cutting, having serrated edges just gives you an advantage in terms of cutting the stuff that you're cutting. The other thing that I like about serrated edges is with a plain edge, you're completely dependent on how sharp that edge is for your cutting. So if you don't keep up with sharpening your blade, it's a little bit dull, you're going to not be able to cut nearly as well with a straight edge. With a serrated edge, this, even if the serrations are not as sharp as they could be, if they need sharpening, they're still going to do some cutting in and of themselves. So the serrated edge, to me, gives you that benefit, too. You don't have to keep it as sharp, and it's still going to give you good cutting performance. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me. Most people seem to like straight edge blades for everyday carry, but that's just not how I roll. And like I said, again, it may just be the type of things that I cut. So I'll point out the partially serrated blade is actually the Nakamura 484S. The S is for serrated, so a little bit different model number. And the thumb stud complaints, uh, if, you, if you look around online, you're going to see some people complain about these thumb studs. They, they feel like they stick out too far. They stand up too far, stand out too far. And when you go to pull it out of your pocket, they can snag on the edge of your pocket and the blade can open in your pocket. And people aren't wrong when they say that, but it depends on how you draw the knife. And what people have found that have figured out how to draw this thing without that happening is what they say is if it's in your pocket, if you rotate it in, if you rotate it into your pocket a little bit, when you pull it out, then it's the the thumb studs aren't going to be able to catch on the edge of the pocket because you've got them rotated away from the edge of the pocket. I've never had that problem, and in trying it out, what I've realized is naturally when I go to draw a, a knife out of my pocket, when I go to pull one of these clip knives out of my pocket, I naturally, when I'm pulling it, I naturally rotate a little bit towards the outside of my body as I'm pulling it. Just about like that, not much. But I don't ever pull it straight out, and this is not something that I try to do. This is just the way I do it. And so that's what, sort of what people are saying is rotate it towards the outside of your body, and that's getting this thumb stud away from the edge of the pocket. So because naturally I rotate it a little bit when I pull it out, I don't have that problem. But some people do, and it's something that I am going to note because it, it is true. If you pull this thing straight out of your pocket, you can't have trouble with that hanging up and it can open that rascal, this very sharp knife, um, in your pocket. So that's a bad thing. You can change the way you draw the thing if you have a problem with it. And um, the other thing that you can do is you can replace the thumb studs. There are lower rise thumb studs that are available that will eliminate that problem. So it's not a deal breaker. You've just got to be willing to take five minutes to change the thumb studs out. Or like I said, in my case, uh, it doesn't seem to be an issue for me one way or the other because of the way I draw the blade. So I've just never worried about it. The scales, which are uh, the outside part of the blade, the handle, as it were, are made from G10. And they've got, if you can see, and even if you can't in the pictures I've got, you'll be able to see, they've got some pretty attractive light texturing on them, but they really don't, that doesn't really contribute to the grip a whole hell of a lot. But these finger cutouts do. And the grooves and the scales that you see also help with the grip. And those are pretty deep grooves. And the net result is this thing feels great in the hand and it gives you a, all told, a really, really solid grip. Uh, like I said, the texturing could be a little bit better, but with the, with the, the finger, the thing, finger cutouts that you've got and the jimping on the thumb rise and everything, you can lock this thing in anyhow. You can get a really good grip on it. So, and that all starts with the, with the scales and with the grips. The liners, if you look, the liners are the metal part inside that the scales are connected to. 
the liners are thick as hell for this type of knife. And normally, uh, there would be cutouts that you wouldn't see. There would be like circles cut out of the inside of the liners. And what that does is that just takes weight off of the knife. This knife does not have any cutouts. Those liners are thick as hell and they're solid. No cutouts at all. So you end up with a heavy, heavy knife relative to the size of the knife. And it clocks in at about three and a half ounces and that doesn't sound like a whole lot of weight and it's not this is not like a super heavy knife but compared to your average run-of-the-mill everyday carry knife this size it is it is pretty heavy and that's another part of how great this knife feels to me it's got a sense of gravitas to it it does not feel like some light weight little knife when you pick it up it feels like you're holding a real fucking tool in your hand because you are the clip is a standard reversible Benchmade split arrow clip. Uh, nothing fancy about that. And by reversible, I mean you've it comes set up for right-handed carry, but you can move the clip very easily to the other side. There's holes there for that. So you can carry it right-handed, left-handed. Again, this is, is made to be an ambidextrous knife. And the way it's set up, it's set up for tip-up carry. And what tip-up carry means is when you've got the knife clipped in your pocket, on this clip, the point of the blade is sticking up. Some knives are set up for point up carry or tip up carry, as it's called. Some knives are set up for point down, tip down carry. Some people get really bent out of shape about that and it's got to be one or it's got to be the other and they have their preference. They either want it one way or another. My last everyday carry knife was tip down. This one is tip up. It took me five minutes to get used to the difference. If you, you spend a day pulling it out of your pocket and using it, by the end of the day, you're going to be used to the difference you're going to change the way you open it. You will have adapted to it. So to me, really it's six of one half does the other. I don't give a damn if a knife is tip up or tip down. I can work with either. And I don't change everyday carry knives that often. I mean, if I buy a new one, I carry that one. So it's not like I'm switching back and forth every day. I'm carrying a new knife and I've got to remember which one is which. I'm only carrying the one. So to some people, that's a big deal. To me, it's not. But, you know, whatever. People, people have their own opinions. Um, the overall dimensions are 3.95 inches closed. 7.03 inches open. Neither of those are out of line for a folder with a three inch blade and the grip length is about perfect honestly when you hold this thing in your hand. You wouldn't really want the grip to be any shorter and it doesn't need to be any longer. So I think dimensionally the knife is great. It's 0.57 inches thick, so it's a little over a half an inch thick and that means it's kind of a chunky knife, but again that feeds into the way this thing feels. It feels like a real tool. It doesn't feel like some little flimsy little thing that you're carrying. So it's thick, it's heavy, it's ballsy, it's got an attitude, um, and you know you're carrying it. And the thickness goes into part of that. So the balance point is right between the first and second fingers. So it's about... Do this without dropping it on my damn keyboard. I'll be pissed if I do that. And you can see where I'm fighting to get it. So that's the balance point right there. It's right in between the first and the second finger. And what that means is that the tip end is a bit light. The weight is a little bit heavier on the back end, so the tip end is a little bit light. And that's kind of nice because that gives you better tip control. If you've got a knife that's front heavy, that's good for chopping, but it's not really good for fine work with the tip. And so this one being a little bit uh, heavy towards the handle end, you get better tip control. So that's kind of a nice thing too. And the fit and finish are pretty much perfect. And for what you pay for this knife, they should be perfect. But I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you they are. Out of the box, beautiful, perfect, nothing wrong with it. It's just absolutely just perfect coming out of the box. So really good fit, really good finish, really good detailing on it. Which, again, it should be because, like I said, the Nakamura is not cheap. Uh, the MSRP is about $230. The street price is about $190. I've actually seen them going for less than that recently. I've seen them going for maybe $165, $170, uh, direct from manufacturer, I think it was. But the street price from a lot of a lot of knife vendors is still about $190. And $190 is a good bit to drop on a folding blade. My everyday carry folders are typically $40 to $60. Bucks. I don't, normally don't spend anywhere near this much money on a knife that I carry every day. Um, so do you need to spend $200 for a solid everyday carry folder? Absolutely not. There are plenty of great folders that you can buy for 50 60 bucks that are going to be premium going to do a great job for you going to be much better than that five dollar bullshit knife that they've got at the 
checkout counter at the gas station. Stay away from those. I said, you're going to hurt yourself with a cheap tool. That's what you're going to hurt yourself with. So do you need to spend that much money for a, a good everyday carry folder? No. Should you is a more complicated question. If 200 bucks is a shitload of money to you, then you shouldn't spend it on a knife when you can spend a quarter of that and get a knife that's going to be just about as good. That's just financial literacy. Uh, but if you've got the money to spend, it's an absolutely amazing knife, and it is better than any other, other everyday carry knife that I've had that I've spent 40 50 60 bucks on. So spending the extra money uh, definitely does get you something more, and what it gets you is the steel, the fit, the finish, the advanced lock, and the, the, uh, the better performance that you're going to get. But do you have to spend that much? You don't. Um, I know a lot of people that would spend 200 bucks on a knife and be afraid to use it. They'd spend that money on it and put it in a drawer somewhere. At that point, I think you're wasting your money. And I'm not going to say I don't have any knives sitting around in a box perfectly new that have never been used to cut anything, because I do. But that's because I buy knives that I don't really need because I like knives. But if you're buying an everyday carry knife and you spend 200 bucks on it, then you're scared to use it. That's just wasted money. So that's the other piece of it is if it's going to if it's going to be a hang up for you that you spent this much money on a knife and you're going to be scared to hurt it, probably shouldn't spend that much money on a knife. I'm going to tell you right now, I definitely have expensive knives that I've beat the shit out of. This is one example. Um, I told you I've chipped, I've chipped the blade in a couple of places. I've done some horrible, horrible things to it. Um, my working fixed blade is a cold steel Trailmaster in SK5, and that's this rascal right here, and that's about a $200 knife right there. That's a cold steel, and I have absolutely beat the shit out of this knife. I have done horrendous things to that knife. I've chopped down trees with that knife just to test the edge retention. How how many trees I can chop down before I have to sharpen the daggum thing. So me personally, definitely, the fact that I've spent 200 bucks on a knife doesn't mean that I won't beat the shit out of it because I absolutely will. And by the way, absolutely recommend SK-5 for a Bowie. SK-5 is excellent steel for a Bowie. And that's maybe another episode, but while we're talking about it, really good stuff. So I don't regret spending all that money on the Nakamura. It has performed superbly. I'm as happy with it today as the day I got it, which is to say pretty damn happy. And so much so that I'm actually toying with the idea of picking up its big brother, the Nakamura 44-1, which uses an even more premium steel. That's a CPM S90V, and it uses carbon fiber scales instead of the G10, so the scales are a little bit more premium. Um, and the CPM S90V has even more edge retention, even more everything, even more everything. It's just even better than the M390 in every way. It's also got the reputation for being really fucking difficult to sharpen. And the street price on that knife is on that knife is almost 250 bucks. So, I'm still sort of up in the air on that. Maybe I'll pick it up, maybe I won't, but how much I like this one and how much I like the steel, it sort of got me jones into play with that S90V steel. So, we'll see. Maybe I will. So, I fell in love with the Nakamura looking at YouTube videos a year and a half ago. That's why I bought it. If you've fallen in love with it today, watching me talk about it, and you're going to buy one, then uh, consider clicking the link in the show notes below and buying it there. Uh, at least that way someone that you like will get a cut of the action, and that would be me. Uh, that'll help support the content that I generate. And so, in closing, I really recommend the Nakamura specifically and properly processed M390 steel in general. Uh, recommend the steel, recommend the knife, and um, in general, it's been a great everyday carry knife. I'll probably keep carrying it for a while until something else catches my eye that I decide I want to play around with. But based on my experience, I recommend the blade, I recommend the steel, absolutely. And um, I guess that about wraps it up. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me talk about the, uh, the Nakamura and M390 steel and steel in general and heat treatment. If you did, please take a second, give the video a like. That's really important for the YouTube algorithm. And it's an easy way for you to say thanks for all the time that went into this podcast. Uh, these podcasts do take time and effort to make. So if you could take just a little bit of effort and sign into YouTube and then check that like, that would be really cool. And be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode. If you subscribe on YouTube, you'll get a notification when I post a new episode so you don't have to worry about checking back to the channel or whether or not you're going to miss anything. And so if you liked it, like, subscribe, 
In closing, for this time, I am Old Man Metal, and thanks again for joining me today. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. If your friends don't like it, get new fucking friends. Until next time, keep those horns up high. Take care. Listening to Old Man Metal's musings. All material depicted is the intellectual property of the copyright holders. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is a goddamn shame. Thank you for joining us.